Okay, so let's uh, let's get in things. Um, so topics uh, seven, eight, nine, and ten. We're going to talk about uh, culturing microbes, identifying microbes, and we're going to be talking about how we can kill them. So we're going to talk about things like disinfectants, and we're going to be talking about um, antibiotics and antivirals and those kind of things. So uh, how do we culture microbes, and why do we culture microbes? Uh, Part of this has to do with identification, right? So you've probably, uh, you know, been in a clinic or a hospital at some point and they're sampling something, right? Whether it's you or family member, um, there's all sorts of different ways to sample. And these are kind of things that you're gonna be learning in your nursing classes and get a chance to do them uh, either on models or, or in person eventually. And uh, like I said, there's all sorts of different types of samples. Uh, I have a little video I wanna show you here. I'm gonna do some swabbing. And uh, this is just kind of an environmental swab, and you can see I'm going to swab my hand and a couple other things. But there's there's all sorts of different things to do. For example, for the COVID test, uh, there's two different types of swabs they're doing. One is a throat swab. The other is called a, a nasal pharyngeal swab, where they kind of go up through your nose, and it feels like they're trying to poke your brain. Uh, but, uh, you know, like I said, there's a lot of different techniques here. So let's take a look. I got a little video here I made and it's just a demo of me doing some swabbing and then I'll show you the results. Okay, so what I have here is a stack of agar plates. So you can see what they are is basically a Petri dish and uh, inside is some agar media. I also have some cotton uh, swabs. I'll open that in a moment. And I have some uh, saline solution here. So what I'm going to do is swab a few things. So the first thing I will swab is the palm of my hand. So you can see here's the, uh, the swab I have. I'm going to get it wet with the saline solution. I'm going to swab the palm of my hand, see if I can get some bacteria off of it. And then I'm going to smear it across the Petri dish, the agar. There we go. Put that aside. Label the plate, so I can label that as hand. There we go. Now I'm going to swab a couple other things. So the second thing I have to swab here is a dish sponge. So this one here, I probably, it's already wet. I don't need a little bit of saline solution. I'm just going to squish it. There we go. Smear across the agar. The second one, so this is sponge, is a used toothbrush. So here we go. Let's see if we can get in there. My son's toes so let's see what we can get in there probably some staphylococcus and the last oh sorry thing I'm gonna swab this laptop so just in between the keys Trying to get in there in the nooks and crannies where all the dust is. Now I'm done the swabbing. I have the plates all packaged up and I'm going to put them in this incubator here. And you can see the incubator. I have it programmed for 30 degrees Celsius. I'm going to put my plates in the incubator and we'll leave them there for a day or two. And hopefully we'll get some nice colonies that grow up on the plates and we can take a look at them in class. So uh, I usually do this in class um, and uh, I'll swab a few students. I'm not doing any nasal pharyngeal or anything like that. It's completely unpleasant, but you know, people, um, usually there's somebody in class wearing flip-flops. So I get some, you know, I get a volunteer's toes and uh, you know, hands and uh, cell phones and a few things like that. I might do, th do things around the classroom such as doorknobs 
or the, uh, the keyboard and, uh, and a few other things like that. It's, it's kind of a little fun thing to do. And I'll show you what the plates look like. So this is done in a medical context. It's usually not directly to the agar plate. Uh, usually the cotton swab is put into some sort of a uh, tube uh, and then put in the fridge or whatever. And then that would go to the, um, uh, you know, to the lab and the lab would take that and, and then swab it on, on different plates. Uh, somebody's asking, is there a difference between swabs and Q-tips? Q-tips aren't usually sterile, but they're, you know, they're pretty similar in, uh, in, in design. It's just a piece of cotton on the end of a stick, right? Uh, somebody's asking about cavity wipes. So we'll talk about cavity wipes uh, next week. So I'll show you the results here. If I can get to the next slide, that would be great. There we go. Here are the results. So there's my hand. There's the sponge. And there's the toothbrush. I will tell you one thing. I am not usually a germaphobe, but the dish sponge is the one thing that consistently always grosses me out. I refuse to touch a dish sponge with my bare hands. They're very, very gross. Uh, I'll just say this though about the hand and uh, you can see all those colonies on there. A lot of that is gonna be Staphylococcus. And how can I tell because I've grown Staphylococcus a whole bunch of times. I can see, if you look very carefully, there's slightly different shades. So it looks like we've got two or three different species on there. So my plan is for next lecture uh, to maybe gram stain some of these things and we'll, you know, that'll be part of the identification lecture. I'll show you some of the other results here. So here's the toes. So that's going to be almost probably 99% Staphylococcus. The keyboard, probably also some Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus is found in our skin. So everywhere humans are, we find Staphylococcus, everything that humans touch. And then uh, I found a toddler and I had this large Petri dish and his hand just fit in the Petri dish. So I thought I'd show you that because it, it turned out really cool. It's very hard to get a toddler to hold his hand uh, still. Uh, so it was a little bit smeary, but uh, boy, it sure turned out really nice. I bought those uh, large Petri dishes a number of years ago so you could do cell phone imprints. And now everyone's cell phone is too big, so I have to find smaller things. So the toddler's hand worked out really nice. So like I said, we'll do some gram stains and I'll show you what they look like uh, 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 for our next lecture. So we'll come back to these plates. So after the sample collection, uh, usually the idea is you want to identify what you have. So this patient comes in. And uh, we think they have strep throat. So you do the swab on the back of the throat. Uh, for strep throat, there is a rapid test now, uh, but that's uh, only been around for maybe about 10-ish, maybe 15 years. Uh, and uh, in many cases, that, that test actually comes back negative. So it's gonna get sent to a lab for, for a, uh, a clinical microbiologist to, uh, to actually culture. Uh, some of these identification methods are culture dependent. So today, this is where we're gonna focus on is is, is the culturing aspect. Uh, some identification methods, oops, there we go, let's try that, may not require culturing. Uh, it kind of depends on the sample, and this includes uh, where we're going to uh, look at things under a microscope or talk about uh, immunological kind of characterization or DNA type tests or RNA type tests. Uh, and so we're gonna talk about all these things over the next maybe two to three lectures. So like I said, this is where we're focusing today on topic seven. I'm not sure if we'll quite get through all of it, but most of it, and then topic eight, uh, we'll, we'll focus on those other things, microscopy and whatnot. Okay, so let's talk about bacteria culturing. Uh, the nice thing about bacteria, uh, whether uh, you're wanting to culture them for disease, um, diagnostic purposes or not, is that they grow quickly, or at least most organisms grow quickly. Uh, I can grow up, uh, you know, a strep throat sample, you can grow that up uh, overnight easily, uh, do a gram stain and have results within 24 hours very easily. Uh, you can see there's some, some growth times for some organisms, so you can see E. coli is on there. And this is, by the way, why E. coli gets so much fame uh, with molecular biologists is because it's uh, very, very easy to grow in a lab. Very easy to culture, grows very quickly, uh, and that includes many, many organisms. You can see I have a few slow growers on here. So the first one is Mycobacterium tuberculosis that causes tuberculosis. Uh, Mycobacterium leprae causes leprosy. And uh, Treponema pallidum, uh, that's uh, the one that causes syphilis. Those are really slow growers. Normally we're not growing those up for diagnostic purposes. If I was wondering if someone had tuberculosis and I wanted to culture it, uh, I'm not gonna get answers overnight. It's actually gonna take a couple of weeks. So we have other methods for tuberculosis and we're gonna talk about those uh, 
most of them fall into a topic seven lecture. So we want to grow these things. Uh, all these organisms, they have um, physical requirements and they have chemical requirements. So I want to just kind of touch a little bit on some of these aspects. So you can see the first one there is temperature. So most organisms fall into this middle category, this optimum category you can see I have here 37 degrees. So you probably know that 37 degrees Celsius is human body temperature. It may not be the optimal growth temperature for the organism. Uh, e. coli actually is happier at 40 degrees. Uh, a lot of the staphylococcus organisms are happiest at 30 degrees. That's why I actually incubated my uh, plates at 30 degrees because I knew staphylococcus grew well and a lot of other environmental organisms grow really well at lower, slightly lower temperatures. Uh, you can see the maximum and minimum growth, you know, for most organisms is, you know, around a 10, 10 degrees minimum, 50 degrees maximum. There are many, many exceptions and I'll, I'll, I'll mention a couple of them. So here's a word to know, mesophile. This includes most organisms. And like I said, their optimal temperature ranges are, you know, in that 20 to 40 degrees range. You can see there's some other words on there, thermophiles. These are some weird environmental organisms that aren't involved in, in health, uh, but they grow at extremely high temperatures. You can see optimal temperature of around 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, we also have these psychotrophs. These are organisms that, uh, again, mostly usually uh, soil organisms that are seem to be very happy at much lower temperatures. Uh, but most organisms are mesophiles. Uh, so there's some optimal growth temperatures of some clinically relevant organisms. So E. coli I mentioned is 40 degrees. So why not 37, you're probably thinking. Well, E. coli is not exclusive to humans. Uh, e. coli grows in anything that's warm-blooded. So we're talking about birds and mammals. And uh, birds' uh, body temperatures are actually higher than mammals. So the 40 degrees uh, shows that E. coli is, is well adapted to multiple, uh, many types of organisms because it will grow, grow very well at lower temperatures too. Just 40 is its optimal. You can see some of these other organisms, Staphylococcus and Mycobacterium, 37 and 37. We have uh, leprosy. I put that on the list because its optimal growth is 30 degrees Celsius. Now I realize that probably most of us have never seen leprosy in our lives. Uh, but you may be familiar with it because it is mentioned, uh, for example, in the Bible and, uh, you know, sometimes movies. And uh, you might know that it's, it's something that happens in the extremities. So we're talking about fingertips and sometimes the people, it happens on the, the tip of their nose and pl in places like that. And, and so it's uh, not growing well in the core of the body, but doing well at the extremities. And that's because it's, uh, it's uh, um, optimal growth temperature is 30 degrees. Uh, treplinema. Uh, I mentioned this is the one that causes syphilis. So you probably know that syphilis is a sexually transmitted disease. And uh, so it turns out that the genitals are a little bit cooler usually uh, than your core body temperature. So it grows well the genitals, uh, which makes it ideal as a sexually transmitted disease. Last one I want to mention on this list is listeria. And I want to talk about listeria for a minute because it's kind of one of these things that is unique in that it grows well at 30 degrees but it also grows really well at cool temperatures. And what do I mean by cool temperatures? I mean like your fridge, and uh, that's a concern. So you can see here's a, here's a note talking about a listeria outbreak. Uh, every year somewhere there's a listeria outbreak. Um, hasn't been one in Canada for a while. This is one of the bigger ones of the last few years. You can see actually that's 2011, so that's a few years ago. And uh, quite a number of people became ill and 25 people died from listeria. And uh, this was a, uh, are those cantaloupes? Is that what those are? They look like something like cantaloupes. Oh, it says there, yeah, cantaloupes. Um, yeah, so, you know, what, is, what does listeria do? Well, I mean, it gives you a lot of kind of uh, typical symptoms, fever and, and uh, gastrointestinal symptoms and, and whatnot. Um, why are people dying? Usually the people dying are, are elderly or, or children, young children. Uh, because the immune system can't fight it off so well. So it's pretty dangerous and we take it very seriously. And every year in Canada, there are listeria recalls. Uh, I was just on the, uh, I think it's the Canadian Food Inspection Agency website, and uh, they give a list of all the food recalls. And actually this year has been a great year in Canada for listeria, I could only find the one. And uh, this was some sort of um, mini spicy cheese sausage. I have not seen that particular one. 
uh, but that recall was in Ontario and Quebec. Um, I found another one that wasn't this year. You could see this was, I was looking for something in Alberta and this sweet pea shoots mix. So this was 2018, this was a recall uh, due to listeria. So it's not just meats, it's also vegetables. It can be spread in animal feces. And uh, like I said, it, it uh, seems to do really well at fridge temperature. So this is a concern, uh, you know, with things like lunch meats and greens that can have listeria on it once in a while. So moving on from temperature to pH, uh, we can also talk about uh, pH, which is how acid, acidic, or how alkaline an environment is. And uh, many organisms love the neutral range. So you can see there's a word for your neutral file. And this includes most bacteria. You can see they're growing in that kind of uh, pH range of six to eight. So eight, by the way, is neutral pH. Just in case you don't know your pH scale very well. And uh, there are a few that fall into that other category. You can see a lot of fungi, kind of like a little bit more acidic pH. I do have one in particular I want to talk about, a bacteria that uh, is an acidophile. And I think I have it, there it is. Found that cool little animation, I just had to share that with you. Uh, you can see it says here, this is something that is found in the stomach. So the stomach is very acidic. And so this organism actually lives in the stomach. So there's a picture of it. This is Helicobacter pylori. And uh, it's kind of a, yeah, like a, an interesting looking organism. It's got a bit of a corkscrew to it. And then maybe you saw from that previous slide, it's got uh, multiple flagella. So most organisms that live in our gut pass through the stomach and the ultimate destination is the intestine. Very few actually live in the stomach. They maybe just the goal is to just survive getting through the stomach. But Helicobacter actually thrives in an acidic environment. And, uh, so probably around half of us have this in our gut right now. And you can see that note there, it says it's talking about gastric ulcers. So half of us don't have ulcers, do we? Uh, some of us do. And, uh, uh, but so it turns out there's different strains of helicobacter, right? It used to be thought that when we first discovered this in the 1980s, that, uh, you know, okay, this is bad, let's get rid of helicobacter. But it turns out there's different strains. Some of them actually seem to protect us from ulcers and stomach cancers. Some seem to promote ulcers, and some are associated with stomach cancers. So the story is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, this is the kind of thing where there's a healthy debate amongst, amongst uh, microbiologists whether this is a natural, normal thing to have in our stomach or whether we should get rid of all of them, because uh, some of them actually, like I said, seem to actually have some protective qualities to them, which is actually very interesting about this. So I know some people are really, um, you know, thinking about ulcers, and there's a lot of uh, old rumors around ulcers being caused by stress and, and bad diet and all that. And that certainly used to be what we thought was the case until, like I said, it was the 1980s when, when this was discovered. In fact, the idea that ulcers are caused by stress is so, was so ingrained into the medical community at the time that these scientists, he was an Australian guy who discovered this, people did not want to publish his research or believe him. And so the crazy thing was, he was like, okay, well, just screw this. I'm going to drink some culture. So he did. He went to his lab. He drank a bunch of culture. got some nasty ulcers and self-treated himself with antibiotics. And, um, and so he became the initial case study where they said, wait a sec, this guy may be on to something. And uh, so a lot of people with ulcers are tested for this. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes, uh, like, there are other, other reasons for, for gastric ulcers often to do with uh, stomach damage, and they can be hard to heal. Um, but uh, this is the primary cause. Uh, we can also talk about osmotic pressure. So what do I mean by osmotic pressure? I, I basically mean what, what organisms can live in salty, salty uh, environments. So you may remember these terms from high school, isotonic and hypertonic. So isotonic means that uh, you have uh, um, the, the salt composition in the cell is similar to the salt composition outside of the cell. So if you take a look at hypertonic, this is where there's a lot of salt in the environment and uh, that kind of sucks water out of the cell. So you probably know if, you, you know if you eat beef jerky or something like that, that that's how it's made. Basically, they put a bunch of salt on meat, maybe a few other flavorings, and it sucks the water out of the cells. And it is actually a good way to preserve meat and has been done historically for a long time. So why is this relevant? Well, think about salty parts of your body, right? Some organisms grow there really, really well. For example, 
our friends, the Staphylococcus organisms. All right, so Staphylococcus. Uh, Staphylococcus grow on our skin, uh, and they're very, very happy there. And why is our skin salty? Well, because we, you know, we're sweating, and our sweat has salt in it. So if you take a look on the left here, you can see this is a, a media where we've actually got Staphylococcus aureus, and we've got Staphylococcus epidermidis. So this is a special media that actually has an indicator that can, that can distinguish between Staphylococcus epidermidis and Staphylococcus aureus. You can see they're both growing on here. The epidermidis didn't spell that right, did I? Um, actually, that's not me. Somebody else made that mistake. Um, you can see it's growing, it's kind of pink, and the Staphylococcus aureus is the is yellow color. Most other bacteria are not growing in 7.5% salt solution. Like, go home and make 7.5% salt solution, try to drink it, because that's, that's a very high uh, saline level. So, what do we mean by chemical requirements? Uh, chemical requirements are what we're feeding these guys. So, this is something that uh, microbiologists are very interested in uh, because partly it has to do with classifying organisms and understanding the overall biology. Um, so you've got to provide all these things for them to grow, right? So carbon source, you know, things like glucose and whatnot to, to give them energy. Uh, nitrogen is important. Uh, again, just a little chemistry for you. Nitrogen is uh, part of amino acids and nucleic acids. Uh, sulfur is found in some amino acids and a few other uh, uh, chemicals out there. And so it's important. And phosphorus is, of course, found in nucleotides. So uh, uh, DNA, RNA, and ATP, and a few other things. So all these things have to be given to the organism. They can't just, you know, even if they're photosynthetic, which we're not worried about in this course, because none of these photosynthetic organisms are making us sick, you've got to provide these as, as, a, as a source uh, for nutrition. Uh, other things that we might include are things like organic growth factors. So what do I mean by that? Usually we mean uh, vitamins. But there's a few other things that sort of fall into that category. These are things they can't synthesize uh, by themselves. And then there's a few trace elements that they need. So something else we may need to feed them is oxygen. So oxygen, uh, of course, um, we need, and you probably know these words here, right? Obligate aerobe. So an aerobe is an organism that requires oxygen, and that would be humans. And a lot of uh, pathogens fall in that category, but not all of them. Uh, what they're showing here is uh, some test tubes of something called a thioglycolate uh, broth. And, uh, and what it does is it sucks the oxygen out of the medium. And uh, so anything that needs oxygen has to grow near the surface of the tube where the oxygen is. Obligate anaerobes you can see grow near the bottom of the tube because there's no oxygen down there. And then there's other organisms that uh, kind of are in between. You can see facultative. That means they could take it or leave it, right? So they, uh, these organisms fall into, into many, many categories. Um, here's one organism that's anaerobic. This is a clostridium uh, perfringens, I think is how you say it. And this is one that causes a, a gas gangrene. Um, sorry for the gross picture. That's right out of the textbook. You can blame the, the editors. And, and uh, so the organism is living in there. Uh, under a, an anaerobic uh, biofilm, basically, is what's going on there. So sometimes we have to culture these organisms. Uh, I was going to show you, let me just switch to my video so that we can, I uh, want to show you, do I switch to that video? Maybe I just need to, hmm. Can't seem to find it. Hold on a second here. Oh, there we go. Okay, I want to show you my video here. Uh, this is an old classic method for culturing anaerobic organisms. Uh, this is called a bell jar. So if you take a look, I have a couple of, uh, of uh, petri dishes here. There's no agar in them, but just to show you that they would fit under here. And there used to be a glass bottom for this bell jar. And the way this would work is that you get something called a, a vacuum grease and spread it on the bottom here. And the vacuum grease is, is actually very similar to, to Vaseline, right? And so and the Petri dishes would go in there and you would put in a lit candle. It would get sealed on the bottom and that's it. So you're probably thinking, okay, lit candle. Some people got it figured out. You know, the lit candle, the, the fire would consume the oxygen in the, in the chamber. So this is actually an old classical method that's used. It doesn't suck out all the oxygen, but maybe 98, 99%. 
Uh, and that's what everyone used to use a long time ago before we had all these other fancy things. I'll show you what these fancy things are. So let's see here, I gotta just switch my screen here. Reshare. So here's some fancy things you can see on the left is a gas pack system. So this, this bell jar, I don't know how much it costs. I found it here in the lab, it doesn't have all the pieces. But, you know, a piece of glassware like that, you know, if it's specially made, you're looking at a couple hundred dollars. But what they really want to sell you is this gas pack system. This is like $1,500 for this thing. And it's basically just a big plastic jar with a very good seal on it. And what they really want to sell you are these gas packs, which are these little chemical packages that uh, react with oxygen in there. And they do a really good job. Uh, they will suck the oxygen out, um, you know, like pretty much 100%. Uh, sometimes people use these gas pack uh, systems and they, um, uh, they will actually flush, uh, they have a tank of nitrogen through there to flush out all the uh, excess oxygen as well. You can see on the right, maybe you've seen something like this on movies. Usually in movies, they're working with something biohazardous or super dangerous, these glove boxes. So it's just a bigger system, a little more expensive. Usually you're flooding those with nitrogen to get rid of the oxygen. Uh, you might use some, some chemicals to get rid of the oxygen as well. So that's how you culture things without oxygen. Most organisms, though, do um, require oxygen and can be grown relatively easily. At least a lot of them can be grown relatively easily just in a, in a normal lab. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about um, pure cultures now. Uh, we've talked about biofilms, and that's unfortunately the way a lot of organisms do grow in the wild, is in these biofilms. And biofilms are really messy. Often you're talking about multiple organisms. It's hard to study them and understand really what you have. Uh, so one of the first steps often people will do uh, when studying something or diagnosing something in a lab is try to grow it in a pure culture so you can figure out exactly what you have. So I want to show you a method uh, that we do that and I think I've got a little video here coming up in a moment. Uh, so one thing you may grow an organism in is a uh, liquid media. So we were talking about all those carbon sources and nitrogen and phosphate and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so often what is done for these broths, there's a, there's a lot of, there's, there's hundreds of recipes. I've got a very thick book in the lab, you know, it's like this thick and it has uh, all, these, all these recipes you can get. Uh, what's often done is people use an enriched broth. I like this one here, it's got a great name, hey? It's like somebody is, uh, somebody has some cookies and they wanted to name them, you know, Aunt Gladys's Terrific Cookies. So they're terrific broth, anyway, I thought that was cool. Uh, if you take a look at the recipe, what's it made of? Uh, the big key thing here is this yeast extract. So what does that mean? It means the manufacturers, like you buy this by the way, and you just add water is usually what you do. Uh, the manufacturers have taken some yeast and they've made an extract out of it. So just like probably baker's yeast or wine yeast or something like that, and you can take the yeast and you can mechanically and enzymatically break it down. And so if you think about it, yeast is a complete cell. And so in the cell, you've got amino acids, you've got fats, you've got uh, nucleotides, you've got minerals, and uh, so they've, breaking, they've broken it up and, and so the whole idea is just to give a nice enriched environment to whatever it is you're trying to grow. You can see on the right there there's some E. coli in the third tube growing and uh, it's a little bit cloudier uh, than the first tube which is, which is the blank. So one of the things I already showed you is agar. And agar is, is uh, good for um, growing colonies, and I'll show you that in a minute. So what, what is agar? Um, it's actually a carbohydrate from seaweed. So there's, there's seaweed right there. I'm not exactly sure how the extraction process works, but they uh, extract the carbohydrate and it, uh, it's kind of a, a powder with a, a little bit of a yellowish tinge to it. I know you can't really see that from the, uh, um, the diagram there, but it has a yellowish tinge to it. And uh, then it's kind of like making jello. You add it to water, uh, you boil it, uh, we have a way to sterilize it, and then you pour it into your petri dish and you let it cool off and then you have your agar plate. So what are we using these agar plates for? Like I said, to look at colonies. And uh, sometimes this is a, a really quick way to say, I think I know what I have just by looking at the colony. You can see in this particular plate here, um, I'm not sure what the sample is, but uh, it's very cool. There's like, it looks like they're counting at least 11 different species of bacteria on there. I'm guessing it's probably a soil sample. That's where we find a huge diversity of, of bacterial organisms. Uh, some organisms have a very distinct 
uh, look on plates. So you can see on the left there, um, I was actually looking at E. coli and Bacillus subtilis the other day. Uh, my photos just didn't turn out quite as nice. So I found these ones on the internet. And uh, E. coli, it's always shiny. Uh, the colonies are a nice circular color. Uh, they're kind of raised a little bit and that sort of creamy color. Bacillus is also usually relatively creamy, but the colonies, they almost look blurry because the edges are so kind of poorly defined and they're always flatter and bigger. So, you know, when I'm looking at these plates, uh, the plate I was looking at incidentally had both E. coli and bacillus on it. And I confirmed that by gram stain. And I knew right away, I'm looking at that. I'm like, that's bacillus and that's E. coli just from looking at the colonies. Usually the colony is not the end of the story because there are a lot that look very, very similar. Uh, some are very fancy looking. I found these ones on the internet. I thought they were really cool looking. I have no idea what they are. They're just very fancy colonies. So I thought I would share them with you. As mentioned before, some of them have distinct colors. Uh, Staphylococcus aureus, aureus means gold. And so it's a nice yellow color. So if I'm taking, uh, you know, swabbing somebody's hand uh, and, uh, you know, usually end up with the whitish ones, uh, but sometimes people have Staphylococcus aureus on them and you can recognize it usually right away because it's got that yellow color. Um, somebody's asking, well, we need to be able to identify these on site. No, no. Um, but it'll be more important for you to know about gram stains. And next week, um, I'm gonna make a massive flow chart for you, kind of outlining some of the information that you need to know around the identification of these things. So just a warning there for next week, if you've got a big piece of paper, that might help. Or next time, I think. Uh, here's, a, um, here's a cool one. Uh, they kind of look like fried eggs. I thought that was really neat. Or you can, you know, you can just make art. <laughs> uh, there's an entire website devoted to people doing really cool things on petri dishes. So if this is something you're interested in, check it out, microbialart.com. Uh, I thought these ones were really nice. Uh, maybe I should have found like a Thanksgiving theme or something like that, because there's like hundreds of images on there. They're very cool. I thought these ones were nice. So one thing that we use solid media for is streaking. Um, so don't get too excited. I know people are thinking, Yay, yay, streaking, Super Bowl. Uh, <laughs> this is not what we're talking about here. Um, and uh, just a, a warning to the wise, um, when you are going on Google, and particularly Google Images, and you're looking for something, and if you are thinking about looking for streaking, but you're thinking about microbiology streaking, make sure you put that word in there, bacteria streaking or microbiology streaking, because you should be just Google streaking. Uh, you never know what you're gonna get. Um, so just a word to the wise. <laughs> uh, so what is streaking? I, I want to show you what streaking is. I have a very short video here uh, to show you um, of what streaking is. And actually, it looks like I have the, the slide first. Uh, so the whole idea of streaking is you want to kind of smear things out on a Petri dish to the point where you're hopefully getting a single bacterium that is going to grow into a colony. So I'll show you how this works. So what you do is you take your sample and you smush it across the plate. So if somebody gets, uh, you know, swabbed for strep throat, let's say, and that tube goes to the lab, um, they don't just spread it on a plate like I showed you with my hand. Uh, they will actually spread it into a corner of the plate. Then what you do is you get a, you sterilize your instrument and then you go through the initial spread and you smear it some more or streak it. That's the term, streaking, right? So the whole idea is now you're hopefully diluting the initial sample a little bit across the plate. And then you do it again, and then you do it again. And if you're lucky, you end up with something like this, where you have individual colonies. And the assumption is that individual colony uh, arose from an individual cell and is genetically ident identical. And then that colony, you might gram stain or something like that to identify what it is. So I'll show you, I've got a quick video here. I can't remember if there's any volume on it or not. I'll just play this for you and you can see somebody doing the process. You can watch her. Uh, maybe I'll make some comments uh, as she goes along. Flame your loop. So she's sterilizing her instrument. It's called an inoculation. Using loop. aseptic technique, remove a small bacteria sample from the tube. Position the Petri plate so quadrant one is beside your non-dominant hand. Remove the lid slightly. 
Starting at the outer edge of quadrant one, streak the loop into the quadrant. Flame your loop and turn your plate a quarter turn. Cool the loop before touching the plate. Place your loop into quadrant one and drag it into quadrant two, zigzagging between the quadrants at least twice. Then continue to streak the loop through quadrant two to cover the area. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop that there, but you can see uh, the basic idea, right? She's sterilizing her instrument, and in this case, it's in a Bunsen burner flame. There are other ways to use sterile instruments and, uh, and spreading it across the plate. And like I said, hopefully you get an individual colony that can be uh, uh, looked at for either further study or further diagnosis. Uh, so mostly we're kind of focusing on culturing bacteria. Um, I will say this, you can culture some protists in a very similar manner. So on petri dishes or similar kind of dishes or in, in liquid cultures, uh, sometimes protists can be a little bit more complex. Uh, we have uh, some of them, like if you look at the malaria parasite, uh, plasmodium, uh, we can only culture actually certain uh, parts of the life cycle. Some of them we can't culture, we don't know how to do it. Uh, so it gets a little bit more complicated. Viruses too can be co uh, complicated, right? And you can see my question there, why culture viruses? Well, uh, obviously, sometimes we want to diagnose things, right, or to study them. But, uh, you know, a big part of uh, virus culturing is actually vaccine production. All right, you can imagine right now we've got all these companies trying to produce uh, coronavirus vaccines. And, uh, like, think about it, right? 37 million people in Canada, uh, you know, so we're looking at, you know, probably, uh, you know, 74 million doses if we're getting two doses. Um, that's a lot of vaccine that produces a lot of viruses. So how do we culture viruses? They're not cells. We can't feed them food. I can't just say, here's some glucose. Uh, you can eat that and you can grow on a petri dish. Viruses, uh, they need to grow inside cells. So we culture them by giving them cells. Uh, and usually the host cell that they need to grow on. So I'll show you a few examples of how viruses can be cultured. Uh, if you are a virus that infects bacteria, so bacteriophage, uh, we feed them E. coli. And these ones are, like I said, really commonly grown. I've grown these in the lab. And what you do is you make a, a what's called a lawn of E. coli. So you spread E. coli all the way across the plate, and then you put, um, then you pipette some, uh, some virus particles on there. And where the virus grows, uh, it forms these little things called plaques. So the plaques are where the virus has gone and killed the cells and broken them open, and so it's not looking like there are any cells there. You can see there's two different plates where you've got different sizes of plaques, uh, so probably two different types of viruses or, or bacteria, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, so for human viruses, there's a whole bunch of different ways, and some viruses we actually haven't figured out how to culture yet. So for example, norovirus, we don't know how to culture that. Uh, the only way that we've been able to study norovirus is uh, in animals. Uh, we can study similar viruses, uh, like there's a mouse norovirus, and in humans, <laughs> In humans, human volunteers. Isn't that crazy? I am not going to sign up for that one. Um, one common way for some viruses, actually you can see there's a whole bunch, is in these things called embryonated eggs. Uh, now many of these viruses are often tweaked genetically so that they can grow in eggs, but this is a really common way to grow viruses for uh, vaccine production. So you might know if you go for your flu shot, uh, often they will ask, uh, you know, are you allergic to eggs? And this is why, because the flu virus is cultured in eggs. And so they just want to make sure they're not going to, you know, give you something that you're allergic to. But you can see a whole bunch of viruses are actually cultured this way. And the influenza virus is usually modified genetically to able for it to grow into eggs, uh, uh, because uh, not all are, are automatically compatible. Uh, another way to do it is to do this in cell culture. So, we can grow human cells in cell culture. It's usually not that easy. Uh, many human cells are very hard to grow and many uh, only grow a little bit. So you could take skin cells, for example, and try to grow them on a dish and they only seem to multiply a certain number of times and then they just stop. So a common way to do this is to transform these cells and make them what is called immortal. So what does that mean? It means we're really making them kind of cancerous. These cancer cells grow really, really well. And so I'll show you kind of the number one cell for growing a lot of human viruses are these HeLa cells. So these HeLa cells have been around since the 1950s. There's, um, I, I can't even tell you how many publications 
have used TLA cells. Thousands and thousands of publications. Um, multiple Nobel Prizes have been awarded to people studying HeLa cells. So what are they and where does that name come from? You can probably see from this slide that the words HeLa, so HeLa, H-E-L-A, comes from two names, Henrietta Lacks. So this was back in the 1950s and scientists were trying to figure out how to culture human cells and they were failing and failing and failing and failing. Uh, this woman here, uh, Henrietta, uh, she had cervical cancer. And she goes in and she's, you know, getting a biopsy. And, uh, you know, the, the doctor who took the biopsy shared a small sample with his friend. And his friend was like, wow, these cells ever grow well. Uh, where'd you get them from? And uh, anyway, uh, this was how they were coding the samples at the time, right? They were using just the, the patient's names, which in the 1950s, like there was no standard practice around this. Nowadays, you may notice a lot of medical samples, they have a code to them, a barcode, no name associated with it. And when you take a biopsy, you're not supposed to share with your friend uh, the name of the patient that it came from. So you can't kind of do that kind of thing nowadays. But back then that happened, these cells were amazing. They grew really well. Uh, we learned so much around cell biology. We got polio vaccines out of them. Um, and so you can imagine everyone's excitement. Where do these cells come from? They're amazing. And they, they figured out his, you know, the code, the, the doctor or the scientist, I can't remember who kind of revealed to the press. And the press went to the woman's family. And of course she had died from cervical cancer. And uh, it's a really fascinating story. If you want to read it, it's a very great human story. That's why I shared this book with you. I, I read this a few years ago. It's an amazing story about uh, this family. And they were a very, very poor black family uh, in the southern United States. And of course, you know, a few years after their mother died, there's press coming and talking to them. And they're, you know, they're talking about all these amazing discoveries. And they're wondering, like, you know, how come we, you know, they're very confused. And, and of course, like people have gotten rich off of these cells, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so very interesting human story if you want to check it out. But this is where we actually grow a lot of our human cells in these HeLa, or human uh, viruses in these HeLa cells. And they're very useful to scientists. And um, if you want to know more about the story, check out the book. Uh, so another part of cell culture is uh, something called aseptic technique. Uh, and you probably will learn in some of your nursing classes uh, various things that may have a similar name uh, to aseptic technique. And, and what, what we mean is that we are uh, uh, treating an environment very carefully and sterilely. And the whole idea is we're protecting really two things. We're, we're, pre we're protecting um, the worker, right? The worker doesn't want to, you know, they're working with staphylococcus. They don't want to get it on their hands and then get it on their lunch, right? Or they don't want to, you know, you don't want to have something extremely pathogenic on the doorknob on your way to the lab or, or clinic or whatever. The other thing is we're protecting the samples, right? So that, that uh, worker there, right? He has staphylococcus on his skin. He's breathing bacteria out of his mouth, 37 million bacteria he's emitting per hour. So he wants to protect his samples. He doesn't want to contaminate his, his specimens or his experiment or whatever he's working on. So there's a lot of kind of technique around this. Some of it has to do with just keeping everything sterile. You can see in that case, he's working in a uh, a biological safety cabinet, wearing gloves, uh, you know, um, and in, in that case, a mask. And not everyone wears a mask. A lot, of, a lot of men with beards who work in labs will actually wear masks, or there's uh, beard masks because, um, you know, often there's there's just more, um, you know, skin cells and things like that that are being released, uh, unfortunately, from from having that. And some people just shed more than other people. It's just that's who you are, part of your biology. Uh, and like I said, a lot of technique there, like he's just reaching his arm in, he's being very careful about not, uh, you know, not exposing those plates to anything else and so on. Okay, so let me see where we are with time here. Okay, I see we're, um, we're probably not quite going to finish this, but I do want to talk a little bit about media. And by media, I mean the food that we're feeding these organisms. So I kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, that terrific broth and uh, that terrific broth is kind of a, it's called a general or complex media. So that, that means you're just, you're just giving it some good food, right? Lots of nutrients in there, lots of amino acids, uh, lots of other things. You can see here's another ingredient for one. This is uh, nutrient agar, it's called, and you can see they're using a beef extract. So 
you know, the factory that made this, like I said, most people, you're buying these things that took some beef cells and they've broken them down mechanically and enzymatically. And now you've got lots of amino acids and other things in there. Often you don't necessarily know what's in there um, other than the beef extract, but uh, it works well for a lot of organisms. Uh, some media are very precisely defined as well. And this is something that is more of interest to scientists uh, and things called minimal medias where people are trying to study genetic mutants or trying to understand kind of the, you know, metabolism of, you know, how is this organism different from this? Or you're characterizing organism for the first time. You can see there's a recipe there on the left of a very well chemically defined media and you can see they know exactly what's in it, nothing else, right? So they're going to have all these chemicals are going to mix one at a time in order to make that broth. Here's an example of, of, a, of a geneticist uh, looking at a mutant of uh, Bacillus subtilis. You can see the, that the wild type grows quite well on this media and the media has um, the only carbon source is lactic acid here and the mutant cannot grow on lactic acid. So what's more important to clinical samples are things like enriched media. So what does enriched media mean? Is it means something extra is added to cultivate a pathogen. Uh, a lot of pathogens are used to very nutrient-rich environments, right? So you can see this, for example, is chocolate agar. I know what you're thinking. It does not look delicious, or maybe you're not thinking that. But anytime I think the word chocolate, you got my attention. Uh, it has a nice chocolatey color, but it's not actually chocolate. So chocolate agar, what they've done is they've taken red blood cells, and they've uh, mechanically broken them open to release all the iron and hemoglobin, right? And so when it oxidizes in the air, it kind of it turns into a little chocolatey color. So this is something extra. Uh, some pathogens need this. They're living in a, in a very nutrient-rich environment. They're used to having access to lots of iron, et cetera. And so they can't grow on just a general media. They need something enriched. So chocolate agar is a good example of that. Uh, some media is what we call selective. So what do I mean by selective? It means some things grow and some don't. So picture that mixed culture, or like I said, a throat swab. Uh, I probably have two to 400 different species of, um, of bacteria in my throat. So we want to see, does the guy have strep throat, right? Uh, and so you don't want, you know, 200 species growing on the plate. So sometimes we use uh, these selective media and it will kill everything, let's say, except for maybe streptococcus. So how does this work? Usually there's something in it. And I'll give you a couple of examples of selective media. You can see there's an example there of a general purpose media, everything is growing. In the selective media, just those dark blue uh, colonies are growing or whatever they are. So here's one here that I've used in the lab. It's called Pseudomonas isolation agar. And you can see it has uh, an antibiotic called ergosan. And ergosan is an antibiotic that kills most organisms, uh, except for Pseudomonas. So Pseudomonas originosa grows, all the other gram-megas and gram-positives die. Uh, so very easy to isolate Pseudomonas in that case using a very selective antibiotic. I do have some other selective media. I'll show you uh, two types of media in particular I want you to know very well, which we may or may not get to cover today. We'll see. Um, here's another selective media. You can see in this case, they're just altering the pH. So these are two soil samples, right? One at pH seven, one at pH six. You can see at pH seven, the bacteria grow very well. At the acidic pH at six, the fungal colonies grow really well. So there's all sorts of little just tricks and techniques to get some things to grow and other things not to grow. So one more definition for you. And then, like I said, I wanna share two types of important media to know. Differential media. So differential is kind of like selective, except for it's not killing things. It's just making some things look a certain color. So I'll show you here. You can see that one species there is growing a nice dark color. Uh, again, there's lots of examples of uh, things that people are doing in labs. For example, um, there's this colored pigment called X-Gal. That's a short form for something. And, uh, this is for organisms that can eat lactose. And when they eat XGAL, they turn blue. So it's very useful to, to look at uh, lactose using organisms uh, using XGAL. Uh, here's another differential media. This is one that uh, we had some in the lab here, and I was hoping to grow some up and take a bunch of pictures. This stuff is so cool. Uh, it's called EMB media or eosin methyl and blue media. And E. coli grows on it, and it grows this really cool uh, metallic green color. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find it. I think maybe it expired and we threw it out. Um, but, uh, but really cool stuff. Okay, 
So there's just enough time here. I want to talk about two types of media that you need to know. Okay, the first is McConkie agar and the second is blood agar. So let's talk about these and, uh, and what they're doing. So McConkie, that was some guy, it's named after some guy who in, uh, came up with this formula. And if you take a look at there, it says it has crystal violet. So remember crystal violet, that's the stuff that is in a gram stain, uh, lactose, protein, and neutral red dye. So the first thing to know is that this media is selective. So it grows only gram positive organisms. So you can see that plate there on the far left, we have Staphylococcus. Staphylococcus is a gram positive organism. And then on the second plate, there's no, no Staphylococcus, only E. coli. So remember, crystal violet is kind of purple, so you can see the plate itself has sort of a purplish hue to it. In fact, the E. coli grows a nice strong purple on it. So how is this killing the gram positives? Well, remember the crystal violet, uh, it can get into their peptidoglycan, that thick peptidoglycan, and, and really it just kind of inhibits their growth. The gram negatives have that extra outer membrane that protects them, and uh, so they can still grow uh, in, this, in this media. So McConkie agar is selective, only gram negatives grow. It is also differential in that uh, different organisms will, will react to the, the red dye and, uh, and come out different colors. So this, this neutral red dye is really just looking at pH. So what happens when they, they digest lactose? Some of them produce acids, and you can see salmonella is in that category, and when it produces an acid, it, it turns a, a yellowish color. Uh, so this is an easy way, because on a petri dish, salmonella and E. coli, they look very similar. And the gram stain, they look exactly the same on a gram stain, they're gram negative rods. So this is a quick way on a petri dish to distinguish between salmonella and E. coli. So the second type of media I want you to know is something called blood agar. So it's literally just that. It's just some media and they've thrown in some blood. So usually they're using sheep blood. Uh, there are some pathogens we have to use human blood, uh, but usually sheep blood is good enough. And so this here is enriched, meaning we've added extra nutrients to it because some organisms require, uh, you know, like I said, the extra iron and all that. And it's also differential because it turns out that uh, organisms may grow differently uh, on the blood agar. So I'll show you some pictures here. Uh, this is actually all at one plate. And uh, you can see we're looking at different types of streptococcus. So we have uh, alpha, beta, and gamma. And so I wanted to write some notes on these and uh, you know what these things are. And we're gonna start talking about streptococcus a little bit more over the next few weeks. So I think I have just enough time to kind of do a little flow chart for you. Uh, and I started making it right here like this. And you can compare this to the pictures. So you can see I've got streptococcus on there. I've got alpha, beta, and gamma. So what does that mean? I'll flip back to the picture probably once or twice to, uh, to show you what it means, okay? But alpha hemolysis, so I'm gonna try to draw on the computer screen. Hopefully my writing comes out neat. neat. So this is something called a we're getting a partial hemolysis here. So what do I mean by hemolysis? By hemolysis, I mean the red blood cells are breaking open. And so you end up with those halos. And we'll I'll show you the picture in a moment. Beta, we've got complete hemolysis. There we go. And gamma is no hemolysis. Okay, why is this not working for me? There we go. Okay, I'll come back to this in a moment. I just wanna show you the picture. So if you look here, I don't know why it goes beta, alpha, gamma on here, but you can see the beta hemolysis, we've got, uh, it, it's just these halos, all those red blood cells have just broken open, and so the red color is all gone. Uh, and that's complete hemolysis. Alpha hemolysis is partial, so you got it looks a little ghosty, uh, but not as much as the beta, and then the gamma, you can see it's growing on the petri dish, but it's not breaking open the red blood cells. So I'm just going to go back to that little flow chart here for a moment. Like I said, I wanted to write a couple of notes for you on this. So we've got alpha, beta, and gamma, and a couple other notes is that the uh, alpha, if you may have noticed from that slide, often looks kind of greenish in color. 
whereas the beta is a bit more clear. So maybe that's another important note to add. So there's a whole bunch of organisms that fall into these categories, but I just want to look at the Streptococcus for now, right? So Streptococcus, we've got Streptococcus, I'm just going to use the short form, which is S, pneumonia. So Streptococcus pneumonia is alpha hemolytic, and uh, you probably know that Streptococcus pneumonia causes pneumonia. So I'm not going to write a note about that. Uh, and like I said, there are lots of Streptococcus organisms, but I'm just really trying to focus on the ones that are important to this class. So the beta hemolytic one is called Streptococcus pyogenes. So that's a P. Pyogenes, I guess, genes. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that one. Uh, so this one here, by the way, often we call the group A strep. If you've ever heard that term, and we're going to talk about what that means. I can't even remember if that's next week or not. Um, sometimes we say GAS for group A strep. There we go. And so what is this one? This is the one that causes strep throat. And then I'm going to put plus plus, meaning it causes a whole bunch of other infections. Um, I am going to put a quick note here to the side in that we also have group B strep. And we're not really talking about groups B strep uh, a lot in this class. Maybe I'll mention them once or twice, but it's just there for, for completion. And same thing here with the gamma hemolytic. We have something that are called the group D strep. And uh, this includes something called enterococcus. So enterococcus used to be called streptococcus and then it got renamed. And so one of the common ones is Enterococcus fecalis, I think is how you pronounce it. It's F A E S H oh. C. There we go. And so uh, this one causes a whole bunch of infections. Uh, one common infection is a root canal infection. And maybe I'll put plus plus on that one as well. So sorry about my writing. I just, it's really much neater on the whiteboard, I swear. Uh, so I think I'm just looking at the clock here and um, we're, we're running out of time. I think I have a few other slides I'll finish up uh, next day. I'll show you a couple other things regarding uh, media, but I do want you to know uh, the McConkie agar and the blood agar and those, those words around it, right? So differential, selective, uh, enriched, you know, those are kind of important words to know. And uh, definitely I, I would ask you some sort of question on the midterm ab about those media, whether it's a, a, you know, short answer or multiple choice, you can definitely expect uh, McConkie agar and blood agar to be on the, uh, on the second midterm. So I'm going to, I'm going to finish there slightly over time here, but, uh, uh, one minute's not too bad, and uh, hopefully you have uh, a wonderful rest of your day, and I will see you next day.